Gracious God, we pray for understanding even as we pray your blessing on the Gillespie children who this day are joined into our family through the sacrament of baptism and the welcoming of their parents into full membership. It is a moving experience when all of us can remember that we were baptized, even if, like Lila and me, we cannot remember when we were baptized. But we are marked as your own, and as your own, we turn to your word this day, asking that you will fill not just our ears, but our hearts, and inspire us for lives of service through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the 20th chapter of Acts, verses 32 through 35. Paul says, And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I covet no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. In this, I have given you an example that by such work, we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of the sermon may seem like a peculiar question. I mean, aren't we supposed to give for what it does for the person who gets the gift, not for us? Well, the answer to that question is absolutely. If our model for Christian life is Christ who gave his life for the sins of the world, then yes, it is our privilege cheerfully and selfishly to give, expecting no payback, because as Paul said in our text for this morning, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This text is at the heart of Paul's goodbye to the church at Ephesus. He's leaving on his way to Rome to prison. He's pretty sure, and he's right, he won't be back. Nero, the emperor of Rome, has figured out that this Christian movement is not just a subsect of Judaism, but is a, a whole movement in itself where someone besides the emperor is professed to be God, and that's threatening to empire. And so the persecution of the church begins, and Paul's imprisonment is a part of that beginning. He doesn't see them again, but he does write to them. He writes to them in his letter to the Ephesians, thanking God for them and for God's gifts of leaders who equip the saints for the work of ministry. In our text in Acts, he blesses the church at Ephesus, recommending its members to God and to the message of God's grace that is able to build them up and give them an inheritance among those who are sanctified. And then immediately he talks about money, about how he's never asked anybody for money, but has worked to support himself and offers himself as an example to them to work and in their work and in their money provide for those who cannot provide for themselves. Paul also talks about what he believes the Ephesians get out of the message of God's grace. The community of the faithful is built up. It's drawn closer together in love and in fellowship and in service. And it's given an inheritance among the sanctified. Sanctification is a big word, and we don't use it very often. But it's a good thing to know is going on in us. Martin Luther, explained it saying, sanctification is the Holy Spirit's work making us holy. When the Holy Spirit creates faith in us, he renews in us the image of God so that through his power, God's power, we might produce good works. 
These good works don't earn us marriage. That's not what merit, I mean, that's not what they're for, but they show the faith that is itself a gift of the Holy Spirit working in us. Sanctification, Luther says, flows from justification, which is God's making us right with God. Sanctification is an ongoing process which is never complete or perfect in this life. We are never good enough. And yet, and yet, the life of those in whom the Holy Spirit is working is a life of growing more and more into the image of Christ, more like Christ. That's what Jennifer was talking about earlier in the service when she told us about what this church has meant in her life. Now, Jennifer is the director of the Oakland Nature Preserve, one of the real gifts of this community to the greater Orlando area as we see native plants, native creatures, and get to know about Florida natural life through the work that she and others with her are doing to make that possible. It's what Stacy and Joe are looking for for themselves and for their children as they have come into membership today. And it's what you helped them, you promised to help them with as we baptize Logan and Noah and Owen. And you promised to help them nurture Lila in the faith as well. It's what we get out of giving as we give cheerfully and freely with no compulsion as we've determined in our hearts to give, we are cooperating with the Holy Spirit working in us to shape us more and more as a community and as members of that community to look like Christ, to be like Christ in our lives. There are stories in scripture and in everyday life of people who don't live that way, of people who build bigger and bigger barns or rent bigger and bigger storage units to hold their stuff, not so that it's preserved to be handed down to their children, not so that it's opened up from time to time and things brought out to share with their friends, no, just so that it's there for them to have. I think about the rich man in the Gospels who built bigger and bigger barns to hold his stuff, and when God came to him to claim his life, God called him a fool. Those kinds of lives result in loneliness and isolation and grief. But that's not the life to which we're called. Ours is a different story. Ours is a story of people called together to be God's witnesses in the world, given enough and to share people being shaped into Christ's image by the Holy Spirit at work in us. A story not of life lived in isolation, but of a community where we are cared for and where we care to share our time, our talents, and our financial resources as together we make a difference as we glorify God, make disciples, and change the world. Amen.